<laughs> I need to find a couple more cables for the bottom ones, but we got Teletubby tied away, finally plugged back in. Hello, it's time for another organ video. We finally got Teletubby tied away set up over there. A bit of a spoiler alert, in the next video of this organ, we're going to start working on the next project, which is the uh, interconnectivity of the museum and uh, wiring up to somewhat of a control space, a control room. Um, we're going to be setting up permanent microphones to record the organ. Rhoda being very kind enough to send over some microphones for that. So we're going to bolt a couple of stereo pairs to the top and to the bottom and then have it going down to an XLR snake, I guess, something like that. So we're going to be able to finally have a nice permanent setup to record the organ quite nicely. But first, let's talk about the problem that we had at the end of last organ video when I built the console brain for the console and I shoved in some pretty dodgy haphazard code into here that I put together barely scraping by. Turn on the open diapason stop on the grate and you do it on the open diapason on the swell as well. Now this is the issue that I haven't sorted out in the code yet. The problem is with what I said about MIDI, it sends MIDI note on and MIDI note off commands. That means when I push it down on here, this MIDI note is exactly the same as this one right here. The problem is, is if I play this one here, my finger's down on this key, I play this one and I take my finger off this top key, it stops and my finger's still playing this. So yeah, if you remember, it was a very simple piece of code and it certainly had some drawbacks. But now, today, let's see if this problem is still there, shall we? Oh! Oh, it's completely gone, even if we stack octaves on the same keyboard. We have no dropouts. How did that happen? Well, I can safely say I wouldn't have been able to figure this out in a month of Sundays. But thankfully, a couple of days after putting that video up, a few people got involved and got in contact. And yeah, we're generous enough to lend a hand in the coding kind of aspect of this because, as you know, I'm not particularly codily endowed. I can sort of scrape something together, but when it gets a bit complicated, it's not. It's woo. Yeah, you need a few more cogs spinning up here than I have, but luckily there are people in the world that do have those cogs. A few people got involved. There's a list of credits underneath us right now. But most notably, Lembe and Chris, who ended up both making two separate pieces of code which ended up working exactly the same after all of this. To the point that I don't even know which code is still on the organ brain and we shall never know and we'll leave it as a mystery. <laughs> Then they suggested to use a composition called Circus Gallop, which is largely renowned as a precursor to Black Midi. It's a very impossible song to actually play by hand, but it was perfect to test these pieces of code to their limit. Initially, at points in the composition where there were so many MIDI on or MIDI off notes going on at once, uh, there would be stuck notes here and there, and it would kind of get a bit confused. <laughs> So when we get onto this MIDI file, you can see um, it's basically turning off this, but to all of these pipes. So if we turn it off and we just have the open diapason playing, it, I, I think it's fine. It'll actually... Yeah, so it stops there. We, we in essence double the signal uh, to another one. Let's see if that's a problem. No. Liblick as well, we've tripled it to, um, I think this is 14, 14 times three MIDI off notes coming out of the Arduino at once. Oh, that's working. And then we're gonna transpose it up, so we're adding, uh, I guess we're adding about another eight MIDI offs, that's about 40. <laughs> Interesting. But 
after a few days and some back and forth, this also got figured out. Hello, so we're just gonna quickly test a few pieces of code. We've got uh, one that's gonna turn on all of the pipes by Lenve right now. And then we're gonna try Lenve's version two. And then we're also gonna try Chris Riggs's version two. And we're gonna see which ones hang up the least. <laughs> Chris and Lenve took two different approaches. The link to both of their GitHubs with the pieces of code are available below because I'll let the code speak for themselves, but I'll read out what they have said in a summary just to kind of sum it up. Now I do apologize, I might miss a couple of bits because I have no idea. This could be talking about parametric flanges for all I know. Chris mentions that he reads the input states, maps it to logic to calculate every output note that should be on or off on every pipe. And also because of the limited serial buffer on the Arduino Nano, we must read and clear the input buffers as much as possible to not miss any messages, which ended up making it work very well. Lenve mentions that he uses one buffer for the keys, one buffer for the stops, and one buffer for the pipes. Every time a change is made to the keys and or stops, the corresponding buffer is updated and the pipes buffer is recomputed to reflect the new configuration. The pipe buffer is then compared to the current pipe's configuration and MIDI note on off messages. Oh my God, I just played a note there. Uh, are set accordingly to reflect the new configuration in the buffer. There's a couple of gudgeon pins, air hooks and parametric flanges mixed in there just for good measure. But like I say, if you have a few more cogs spinning up here than I do, then definitely go and check out the code. And also you can chat to Lenve and Chris over on the Look Mum No Computer Discord. The link is also below as well. Anyway, on to the next part. The next port of call came about because I had a problem down here and initially I couldn't actually get to it. And the only way I was able to get over there was to move the console and stuff around. And it became the perfect time to put the console on wheels. I've got to get this on this. It's worth a go. Let's try it anyway. I don't know what I'm going to do if I can't, but we'll give it a go. Oh yeah, that, that ain't going nowhere. Well, I put them in hope it doesn't anyway. <laughs> it hasn't gone anywhere yet. So we're all right. Oh, trapping lights, thank God for that. Well, we've made it and it's all still on the roof, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, let's get off and get this platform built, shall we? So yeah, I started measuring it up and uh, putting some things, getting out some tools, doing some cutty cutty things on this bit of 18 millimeter ply and adding some strengthening underneath it uh, so it uh, can take the weight of things and then also adding these trolley wheels but from the top so that it keeps the whole platform very low and it's working out quite well and then I gave it a little bit of a test and it turned out to be a really good and um, pretty big skateboard. I, I didn't dare take it out and give it a go but I, I wish I did before I bought it the console soul on it now. Uh, then I used some really old varnish. You'll know it's really old because I did mix it but then halfway through it decided to change colour and I poured the bottom remnants of it out and it all just went a bit wrong and yeah. Oh, that was so annoying. So I solved it in the only way I knew how and that is with big old gloops of black paint. Oh, I've made a painting without even having to go to five years of art school. I call this one expired varnish. Oh, darling. Oh, I really want to keep it now. It's kind of funky. This is the second in the series. I call it Foundations. Every brushstroke tells a story. This is the third in the series. I call it simply Change. And yes, it really portrays my struggles as my short-lived career as a canvas artist. This brushstroke is definitely my favourite. But as you can see, when you sit back and take it all in, you can really... Really smell a change. I don't tell the paintbrush where to go. It controls me, you see. I am not the artist. I am merely the vessel for the creativity. Part four of this series is called Closing In and it shows the struggles and strife of us as a civilization. Uh, as you can see, the black void is closing in front of us. But as it closes in, there is always hope. There is always an escape. 
It's edging ever so closer to its final form. And partly we have part five of this canvas series. I call it the 11th hour. Time is nearly running out. There is still escape, there is still hope. And I will be leaving this part uncovered just for the next artist, painter, to really henceforth. Mitch have hacked modular pot pie the other day to help fix a few brawling cures. Sound, this one's gonna keep you busy. Yeah. Ooh, look at that one. Solid oh, state. Oh, I remember this one. Uh, yeah, so this has been modified to bypass this one what? or something. Oh, we're gonna have to plug it in and see what it's done. And also plug a prototype of a punch card reader synthesizer module into Cosmo. <laughs> Much cooler. <laughs> If you're interested in that, the link to his YouTube channel is below. Definitely check it out. He's got some very interesting projects. But whilst he was there, he also lent a hand with a bit of brute force to get the console onto the top of the platform. End of the series. <laughs> The organ stool is bolted in place. I cross-checked the distance between this with a local church just to make sure that it sort of fits. And it is actually adjustable so it can fit anybody's height. It's actually really simple with that. All you have to do is take a sit on it. And yeah, how it works is if you're a bit taller, you just sit a bit further back. If you're not as tall and you're a bit shorter, then you just sit a bit further forwards. It's that simple. Also, it's come up a lot in a few videos, people mentioning that I should finish off the console with uh, some wood around it to kind of finish it off. But I've got to be honest, I really like the fact that it's very skeletal in form. It shows what it does. It doesn't hide anything. And it's mainly built of the parts that were in Joan's house. The bits that were around it was the rest of the building. So there's no point adding bits and bobs to it because I think it will just turn it into a bit more of a Frank than it already is. But now including the see-through screen and all that stuff, you can see all the bits and all the functioning and all of the electronic parts. The only downside to this is it does cover up the pipes quite a bit. So in the next video, we're gonna be building a platform to raise these up quite a bit. Maybe even a staircase, let's see how that goes. But the next thing we're gonna to touch on is this thing right here. Yeah, this thing right here. So to organ people, this next part will be old news, but to everybody else, it might not be like myself. I wasn't actually aware this was even a thing. Organs actually have presets that you can program and recall. I know, it's crazy. They've been doing this for a century or more, and there's a lot of different designs and ways of programming and recalling organ presets, including pneumatic ways, electromechanical ways, but in this instance, it's actually a switch matrix kind of fashion. And the preset recall buttons or pistons are actually these things right here. And these plug into the preset panel. Let's have a look at that. So this is the preset board settings panel, something like that. So this was on the wall in that little area behind the console. And of course, when I went to go and pick up the organ, I had absolutely no idea what the fudge this was. The owner of the house also didn't. They mentioned it might have been something for volume, which I guess in some sort of way it is, but the actual function of it is quite simple. It's basically a, a switch matrix. These little bits of metal right here, what you do is uh, if you put it onto this screw head, that means when you flick the piston, underneath the keyboard that is assigned to this line of setting switches. That's assigned to this preset. Uh, this side, if it's over on this side, it will turn the great 15th on. If you flick it over to here, uh, well, it will turn it off. Uh, so you can set multiple settings for a different performance. So this setup for this organ right now, it has uh, three sets of presets for the great console. And there's also three for the swell right here. One of them is broken off, so we need to find a little replacement bolt for this one, but that's not a biggie. So yeah, this aids changing quick settings, much like a preset in a plug-in or a synthesizer, but from eons ago. The electronics of this one in particular is very simple. There are other ones that are a lot more complicated, but looking around the back, it's just a bunch of wires. These lines of wires right here go straight to the piston switches that are on the actual keyboard console, and they simply connect to the back 
of uh, these. So they connect to that, which conducts through this piece of metal, which then connects to either this screw or this screw, which then conducts over to uh, these set of wires here, which travel over to this central part. So for instance, if you push one of the buttons and it travels, the electricity travels to all of these at the same time, and then depending what the settings are on this, travel over to the main bus, which then tell the stops to either flick up or down via these wires right here. But in order to make this work, we're gonna have to rewire it. So let's get this uh, connector off the back. We're gonna flick these old staples off. Try not to get tetanus whilst you're doing this. Lovely gerbly. Time to get soldering, okie dokie. The first thing to do was solder all of the wires loosely on the back of it, uh, kind of in place of where the old ones were, but now they're new and they're all uh, equal lengths, we can look lovely whilst we're trying to figure out the rest of the circuit. Uh, I added this Arduino Mega, this is the same as all of the other kind of Arduino setups on the MIDI keyboard in the organ, so keep it standardised. Remove the end of that and use the actual enclosure on that side to use as a standoff. Now we got to do all of the soldering between the preset board and and the Arduino. So it's going to basically act as a big fancy keyboard controller. You'll make sense in a bit when I describe it all. But yeah, after fiddling with that, I added this D-sub connector, which is then going to connect over to the pistons in the uh, keyboards. So the white wires go along and select the presets. And that's a case of putting it back together. And after putting it back together, you admire all of its beauty. It's kind of like a big, really retro dip switch in a way. It's it's a really odd idea. And I haven't seen one before. It's, it's really fun. Anyway, let's get it plugged in. So we've now got it wired up. We haven't got the front cover on here because we still need to code it and make sure it's working. But all of the wires are in it, as you can see. So it's weirdly enough wired like a glorified MIDI keyboard in a weird way. How it works is there's this little D-sub connector right here. And that is going to connect over to another D-sub connector around the back of the keyboards, which are connect to the wires that are attached to the pistons on the manuals, the keyboards right here. So what happens is when you push one of these buttons here, it sends that wire to ground. The wire that has been connected to ground then travels through here and depending which one it is going down, let's say it's this one, the electricity goes down here and then through all of the contact connections here that then travel up either the stop on or stop off wires that travel up here and into this Arduino which then sends MIDI out to tell the console brain which we made in the last video to either turn the designated stops on or off. So what happens is you push the bloody button, it goes through the preset and it turns on and off the designated stops that you need it to turn on and off, all via MIDI. These are the wires that connect to the piston buttons that are around the front of the keyboard. For instance, for the bottom keyboard, this one attaches to all of the buttons on one side. We're going to wire this to ground. Then we're going to wire each of these to the designated pin connections on the D-sub connector. So it then travels over to the preset board. Let's wire the D-sub connector over here. The reason I've put the D-sub connector so far away is these two keyboards are actually on a hinge to open up so you can get to the top of the bottom manual. So the wires over here, you don't want them going over here because we won't be able to open it. So we're going to go around and then into there so we can still open it up and it doesn't mess with it. Same as usual, solder some nice long cables on there and then you can cut them down when you get the right length for them so they're all nice and uniform and pretty. Ooh. They're all wired up to the designated pins on the D-sub connector. I'll do a bit of cleaning up when I know it works. There's also these two blue wires here. These connect to another piston which is under the swell keyboard and uh, this button, I'm not sure what it was used for. What might have been used for? I think I might turn that button into an all MIDI off, like a MIDI panic switch, which basically turns any stuck notes off. So not only do these buttons travel through the switch matrix and up to the Arduino, they also go to these LEDs that I added at the bottom, so we have an idea of the presets that we're pushing. So as you can see, that one's got a bit of a bit of a sticky contact and that will hopefully sort itself out. Here we go, here we go. Look at that. So we're able to set the presets with the buttons. 
Lovely jubbly. Lovely jubbly, if I don't say so myself. So I'm going to quickly program the Arduino. Funnily enough, it uses pretty much the same code as the keyboards because all that's happening is this is essence being a bunch of MIDI keys that send MIDI data over to the stops that we programmed to talk in the last video. If you haven't seen the video about these stops, well, go and check out uh, organ number 12. The link is below. So let's get that coded and this bolted up. Oh dear, I've made a bit of a fundamental oversight with making this. And yeah, I should have used my mind because it would have been obvious that this was going to be a problem, but I didn't use my mind because I'm a dumbass. So let's say this first preset, we set it something like this. This is just a, uh, this is just randomness. Let's just do this, do this, do that, do this, do that. And we push this button, push the button. Uh, you'll see it works. If we do another preset that is exactly the opposite to this, so this one goes there, this one goes there, this one goes there. Yeah, that's fine, that's working as it should. However, if this one has slightly similar ones to this one, let's say we flick uh, this one over to there, what happened? look what happens when I push the button. Oh no, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, both of them turn on at the same time. This is a problem with button and switch matrix. I've spoken about it loads of times in videos. But what happens now is this one is connected to this one around the back. So when the electricity runs up here, well, it kind of jumps through here and ends up going through here and kind of turning on all of this. So if they share any similarities, that means there'll be crosstalk. And yeah, we don't want this because it's going to happen a lot. So we need to fix this. What a donut. I forgot that was going to be an issue. So the problem is right now, if there are two settings the same on some of these, they'll all end up cross-talking and it just becomes completely useless. How are we going to solve this? Well, we're going to solve it the same way that we've always done when this kind of problem comes along and we're going to use diodes. You can think of diodes like one-way streets for electricity. There's a stripe on one side of a diode and this kind of denotes which way you want the electricity to travel. Uh, you can think of it in different ways, but if you make sure the positive potential difference, the positive voltage, is on this side and the lower potential difference the ground is on the side where the stripe is you can imagine the electricity just flowing on by so what we have to do is in essence isolate uh, the matrix here and put diodes all over the place i've just got to figure out where's best to put them so for all of these the voltage is coming from the arduino it's going down into here it's traveling through these wires so if we're selecting this preset and the electricity is traveling over here, we need to in essence make these one-way streets so the electricity doesn't flow back down onto this one instead, which is not what we want. And unfortunately, the only way we're going to do this, I think, is unwiring all of these ones that are going along and adding diodes to every single one of these connections which is a bit of a pain in the ass. I think I know how I'm going to wire them up. I must be honest, I'm getting a little bit confused with it, but I'm going to put some in and see if it works and then we'll carry on making the whole thing because the worst thing to do is put them all in backwards or in the wrong way, plug it in and it doesn't even work. That would be horrid. So you can see I've put a diode here, 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 and one here, here, and here. With any luck, that means if we put the settings all onto the same uh, wire over here, it won't be cross-talking anymore. And if that works, we'll just uh, wire the rest of the diodes in. Right, there's no cross-talk and it is working. So let's get all of the other blooming diodes on there. <laughs> Yep, this is just a case of cutting those uh, quite thick wires there and replacing them with diodes and other wires. A couple of hours later and we have the diodes sitting on the back. So let's uh, screw it back in and see where we're at. So I then spent a few hours putting the code together, figuring out where all the wires went, cleaning the contacts, rebuilding some of the switchover contacts and things like that. And there was countless amount of swear words happening then, but thank fudge, it's now working. So if you put the contact on this side, it will lift the stop flap up. If you put it on this side, it will put the stop flap down. But if you leave it in the middle, it won't affect it at all. So if you leave it in the middle, you can still flick that and it won't be changed at all, no matter where you put the preset and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. So I've set a couple of presets over here on the swell. Let's give it a go. Please bear in mind, I've got these keyboards back to front. So that's something to bear in mind before the next video. But if I flick the presets, a bunch of these should move. Oh, here's the first preset, two down. Then we got them all down. 
Now we got them all up. So now we can change all of the stop settings all at once. How crazy is that? Right now we've just got the solutional and seller set. Flick it over to the open diapason. And then all of them. Hey, it works, it blooming works. I need to do a little bit more messing around to make them really work properly, but it's really coming along. And with the great presets, we can also turn on and off the uh, bass pedal. And these ones are working as well. Yeah! Oh yeah! To add MIDI to this was actually an afterthought. I was never intending to do this, but this means now you can actually record the preset changes if we were to record a performance on here and then recall the MIDI file. However, some of you may be quick to notice a couple of issues with that, and we're gonna try and solve those by the next video. There's also a couple of bugs which are hopefully gonna get fixed by the next video as well. Anyway, enough about presets. Let's play it out with a full version of the Circus Gallop, shall we? Mm -hmm. 